afternoon. I'm Matt Cooperberg from the Department of Urology and Epidemiology and Biostatistics at UCSF. And it's a pleasure to share some re-thoughts with you on prostate cancer epidemiology, screening, and diagnosis, which is a lot to cover in 10 minutes, so we will jump right in. In terms of the epidemiology, the patterns of disease across the United States, prostate cancer, as many of you probably know, is by far the most common cause of cancer identified among men in the US, nearly a quarter million cases anticipated for 2021. Um, it is the second most common cause of cancer death among men, exceeded only by lung cancer. Uh, but the number of deaths every year is far exceeded by the number of diagnoses. And this already gets us toward the dilemma which has faced us for many years, which is identifying those cancers which might be lethal and treating them while avoiding over-diagnosing and over-treating the ones which we describe as indolent, meaning they would never cause any symptoms or threat to life if we do not find them. Now, over the years, we know with changing screening policies in the United States, we've seen major shifts in incidents up and down. At the start of the PSA era in the 1990s, prostate cancer incidents shot up as we found many tumors. We settled out to a fairly steady state here. And then as the US Preventative Services Task Force recommended more and more strongly against screening, incidence rates plummeted um, over the last decade to levels we had not seen since the 1980s. And now we're starting to recover again. In the meantime, cancer mortality rates, which for prostate cancer have fallen nearly 50% at a steeper trajectory than any cancer except lung cancer, where the trajectory can be explained by smoking cessation rates, uh, this rate has actually, this drop in mortality has actually plateaued in recent years, in part, not entirely, but in part because of drops in screening. And it's worth pointing out, we will have a whole talk later on racial disparities by Dr. Roach, but it's worth pointing out already that while we have seen drops in mortality for both black and white men in the United States, this gap, this delta, has not narrowed over the years. Black men face over a two-fold increased risk of lethal disease compared to white men, and this has been true over many, many decades without much change. And it's also true that the greatest disparity in terms of race is borne by younger men. This is looks at men in their late 40s, 50s, heading up to 60s. And for men in their 40s and 50s, the racial disparity is three and fourfold for black compared to white men. And this disparity is actually quite different from locale to locale across the United States. Uh, this plot here looks at the delta delta, so the change over time in the racial gap. So the white bubbles here are changes in mortality for white men compared to changes in mortality for black men comparing the early 1990s to the late 2000s. San Francisco is fairly typical in that there is a similar drop for both white and black men without any real change in the gap. Um, in the delta between black and white men over time. Some cities have seen a, a greater drop for um, uh, white men compared to black men, um, and others like Oklahoma up here have actually seen a rise in mortality for uh, black men and a drop for white men. And this, you know, this does not necessarily reflect specific policies, policies in the different cities, but it does emphasize the fact that a lot of these trends really do need to be looked at at the local level. Now, what about screening? So you know, to summarize a very complex history in one slide. Now, throughout the 1990s and 2000s, as PSA hit the general, uh, general usage in primary care, we didn't do a very good job. We implemented prostate cancer screening poorly. We tend to over-screen older men. We under-screened younger men. We over-treated low-risk prostate cancer and under-treated high-risk disease. Now, despite all this, remember that graph I showed a few minutes ago, prostate cancer mortality rates have fallen over 50% in large part, not entirely, but in large part because of screening. Uh, but the cost of this was far too much uh, over treatment of low risk disease and many avoidable long-term side effects. Now the screen none stance by the US task force when in 2018, that in 2012, they said don't screen anybody ever was not the right solution. Rather, we need to figure out a way to screen smarter. But I would argue that PSA is actually the best screening biomarker in the history of oncology. We just need to figure out how to use it better. And at the heart of the dilemma um, is the fact of diagnosing cancer and what that means. This is a great cartoon from Laura Esserman, who's a breast surgeon here, and Ian Thompson, a urologist in Texas, uh, thinking about screening for any cancer. And the idea is we can screen periodically over a person's life, whether this is PSA testing, mammography, colonoscopy, doesn't really matter. The idea is if you get to the far right of the graph here, you've died of something else, usually heart disease. If you get to the top, you've actually died of the cancer. And there are many prostate cancers that we don't find, even with aggressive screening. These are the so-called autopsy tumors. Um, if you live long enough, almost every man will get a couple of cancer cells in the prostate, and these don't matter. 
Then there are the ones that we can find, we can quote unquote cure them when they're still confined to the prostate, but had we not found them, they would have caused no problem. These are the overdiagnosed tumors, which we need to avoid treating. Then there is a population of, of tumors that we can find. We can treat them before they would have gone on to lethal disease. And this is where we really think we have seen the benefits from screening over the years. And then finally, there are prostate cancers where the PSA is 0.6, then it's 0.7, then it's three. And by the time we do a biopsy, uh, the, the cancer has already spread. These are fortunately very rare in prostate cancer, but this is why we don't screen, for example, for pancreatic tumors because of the rate of rise. The tension really is about the rabbits versus the turtles and the impact on the turtle population from chasing the rabbits. Now we do have a number of trials which help inform what we know about the impact of screening. Lots of controversies around these, but to summarize things very briefly, two European trials, the ERSPC and the Jotaberg trial in Sweden, do show a drop by about 20 to 40% in prostate cancer mortality with screening compared to no screening. There was a US trial called the PLCO, which you may hear is, is a counterweight to the European trials showing no benefit, but in fact, it was not informative because the vast majority of men who were not supposed to get screening in the, Amer in the US arm did in fact get at least one PSA test. So the US trial really did not answer the question. The problem though, as I alluded earlier, is how we have done screening. So if you look at the typical age that a man gets a PSA test in the US, it's in his late 60s and early 70s. This is far too late because the problem is PSA is prostate specific antigen, it is not prostate cancer specific antigen. And as more things happen to the prostate as a man gets older, in particular, the prostate tends to grow. There tends to be BPH, benign growth of the prostate. PSA becomes harder to interpret. The ideal time to screen is much younger, uh, but we don't see much screening for men in their 40s and 50s. And we've also overtreated and undertreated over the years. So these are data from the capture registry, which we've run at UCSF for many years, uh, showing that over decades from the 1990s up to the uh, start of the prior decade, the use of active surveillance for low risk prostate cancer was typically around 10%, far too low. Went up rapidly to 40% just in the most recent years, but this is still, this is progress in the right direction, but still not where we need to be. And in the meantime, we've tended to undertreat high-risk disease. Um, historically, up to 50% of men with, it, with aggressive prostate cancer has got hormonal therapy alone with no attempt at cured surgery or radiation therapy. This is also improving, but we still have work to do. So can we do it all better? Well, the answer is yes. Um, in 2020, 2021, uh, we do have relative consensus across the different guidelines agencies. I'm not gonna go through the details here, but all the major guidelines do now argue for shared decision-making between primary care doctors and men about the risks and benefits of PSA testing. There's disagreement in terms of the optimal ages to screen, but there's really less and less of a controversy that screening should be offered. The question though is how we do it. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the best time to screen is a man who's relatively young and does not have BPH clouding the waters in terms of interpreting the, the PSA. The thing is when we screen a younger man, we need to forget all about 4.0 as a threshold to define normal. Uh, so some terrific studies with very long-term follow-up have been able to demonstrate that if the PSA is less than one by age 60, which it usually is, prostate cancer can basically be taken off your list of, of worries for the vast majority of men. 90% of prostate cancer deaths happen in men who have a PSA greater than two at age 60. And if we turn back the clock to looking at men in their late 40s, we can actually make predictions out to 25 years where three quarters of the population, that's the bottom three uh, lines here, can basically not worry about prostate cancer. All the money is in following those in the top quartile. Now this is defined by a PSA threshold of about 1.4 for men in their 40s, not 4.0. So how do we screen smarter? We are now doing this at UCSF. Uh, we've implemented this in primary care. We're recommending early baseline testing for men uh, between ages of 45 and 75 uh, with aggressive secondary testing for those with borderline PSAs before going on to biopsy. So PSA should not be interpreted in a vacuum. We can think about it with factors like PSA, family history, digital rectal exams, uh, to predict not only the likelihood of having cancer, but of having a high grade cancer that might need treatment if we went on to biopsy. And we'll hear a lot more, a lot about biomarkers throughout this whole meeting. Uh, but in 2021, we have many, many markers to help with pretty much every decision along the continuum from whether we should get a PSA on to what to do about advanced disease. Um, specifically for the question of men with elevated PSAs, contemplating biopsy, we've got a lot of tests that we are now using routinely at the point of care, 
these are non-invasive blood and urine tests to help us decide whether to go forward with a biopsy. And at UCSF, we're using the, the 4K, the EXO test, uh, select MDX quite heavily, as well as multi-parametric MR. Uh, MRI is being used more and more around the world uh, to help guide biopsies. I think it's controversial whether MRI can actually replace a biopsy, and I would argue in 2021 it cannot, because there's too much variation from radiologist to radiologist in terms of the accuracy of their interpretations. This was a nice study from Stanford, uh, which suggested if you had, which showed that if you had a PIRADS 5 call, meaning a high, high risk lesion on MRI, the likelihood of actually having an aggressive prostate cancer ranged from 40% to 80%, depending on which radiologist happened to read your scan. And I would not claim that things are necessarily better at any other major center. So the argument really is that uh, MRI can augment, but should not replace a systematic biopsy. And I would also make the point that ultrasound is still an excellent diagnostic modality. And we looked at a large series of our cases here at UCSF. And it turns out that MRI uniquely identified the highest grade tumor only 6.5% of the time. Uh, we find uh, as many or more with ultrasound and actually with a good systematic biopsy, we do pick up most of the cancers. So to summarize, we really should be thinking about screening or offering screening to most healthy men with a good life expectancy beyond 15 years. And we really think, need to think about tailoring intensity, intensity of screening, depending on that baseline PSA and other risk factors. Um, emerging markers can really help us with decision-making about biopsies. And we here manage low-risk prostate cancer almost entirely with active surveillance, as we will be discussing later on in the meeting. And it goes without saying that if we are going to treat, it must be high-quality treatment, minimizing side effects, and we need to keep tabs very closely on the quality of care we deliver. Thanks for your attention. And we will talk more about the specific treatments in the next sessions. So uh, at this point in time, we can field just a few quick questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kupperberg, uh, comment on the relationship between PSA density, 4K score, exosome DX, and MRI in terms of screening and thresholds for first-time biopsy recommendations. And then are there less invasive tools to use instead of biopsy? Uh, yeah, those are related questions. Um, all the tools you just mentioned and the ones that I alluded to in, in formal talk are Man, all tests, I'm, are all, all non-invasive tests that we use um, in terms of improving decision-making about whether a man needs to go forward with biopsy. In 2021, the only way to diagnose a cancer remains biopsy. Neither MRI nor any other test can conclusively say that there is prostate cancer there. Um, not only that, but only biopsy will tell us which are the high-grade cancers that need treatment. And for that reason, biopsy is still the, the final word. But in terms of making decisions based on PSA, yeah, we're using all these tests more and more to try to make better, more refined decisions. So PSA density, that's the PSA related to the size of the prostate, tries to get at the question of how much of the PSA we might comfortably write off to BPH. These other tests, 4K, exosome, select MDX, we use them quite heavily for men who have gray zone PSAs trying to decide if we should go forward with biopsy. And these tests are all calibrated for what we call a good negative predictive value. What that means is if we run a test and it's negative, you can be pretty confident. It's usually around 90 to 95% confident that there is no high grade cancer there. There might be low grade cells, but no high grade prostate cancer. If the test is positive, maybe there's a cancer, maybe there's not, at least a high enough likelihood we should consider going forward with biopsy. But the tests are set up so that a negative test is very reassuring. And the MRI, like I said, helps us helps guide the biopsies, but it's not as good as a, as a screening test to rule men out entirely for biopsy. 